Welcome to the Happy Black Woman Podcast, where we're on a mission to empower women to transform their lives through personal development and entrepreneurship. We bring you all the information, inspiration, and motivation you need to create a life of happiness, success, and freedom. Now, please welcome your host, the happy black woman herself, Rosetta Thurman. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Happy Black Woman podcast. I'm Rosetta, and I am here on the line speaking with the Evita Turquoise Robinson, founder of No Madness Travel Tribe. Hello, hello, Evita. How are you? Thank you for being here. Uh, Some of you may remember Evita from our Black Women of Power event in New York. We had an amazing panel and we posted the video on our YouTube channel and on Facebook and have been getting comments and messages about how great it was. And now we get the chance, the privilege, the opportunity to continue the conversation today. So Evita, for everyone who doesn't know who you are or who No Madness is, tell us a little bit about what you do and what No Madness is all about. Yeah, so I'm the founder and creator of No Madness. Essentially, we are an international urban travel group. We're about 16,000 members worldwide at this point. Not just vacationers, but avid travelers and people who put traveling and seeing the world as a priority in their lifestyle. And that really bridged for me being a three-time expat in my early 20s and trying to find a community that I felt like I could relate to with this travel world. And it wasn't really out at that time. Now there's a bunch of different options that people can kind of go to. But yeah, like through No Madness, we were the first in what is known now as the urban travel movement or the black travel movement and really kind of spearheaded this dent that we've created in the actual travel industry. We're primarily African-American and primarily travelers, female travelers of color, which is really, really cool because it's like shattering, you know, these stereotypes. It's not what you see in mass media, which was big for me because my background was in television production. Like I wanted to create a home and a community that, you know, really embodied the antithesis of what you were seeing, because I knew that travel was more than what was being, you know, shuttled out to us. And it was definitely something that was happening in our demographic, but just in a unique way that was ours. Mm -hmm. So really, we, you know, created this part of the genre in the travel industry. And, you know, we're continuing to build this family-like community that we've had for just over five years now. Wow. 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 I love that you shared the demographics because that's the demographics of the, our, our happy black women listening here. And I know so many of us have travel aspirations and we want to see the world as well. Five years. Tell me what it was like five years ago. Like, like what was the catalyst for you starting this community and actually setting everything up? Five years ago was I was freelancing in television, kind of taking any gig in New York City that I could, making every month by the skin of my teeth and, you know, really just trying to figure out what the next moves were. I had this wanderlust, but I didn't have a bank account that could really suffice for it. But at that time, I had also traveled so much of a part of my 20s that I realized that you didn't have to be affluent to be able to travel and see the world. Like I'm a, I come from a backpacker lifestyle. Like I was in and out of hostels. I was, you know, taking the trains around Southeast Asia by myself. Like, you know, it was really about seeing the world. It didn't really matter how I did it for me, you know, and I wasn't in a financial position to even be able to have a choice, to be honest with you back then either. So you know, right after I graduated college in 2006, like I moved to Paris six weeks later when everybody else was looking for a job. I was like, I'm going to Paris. I'm going to take this filmmaking workshop with the New York Film Academy. I'm going to do it at, at La Famille's, um school in Paris and see what happens. And I didn't realize that that was going to be the catalyst to really changing my life, you know, like bridging my love for art, which I still have. That's why you see things like media still involved with No Madness, our web series with Issa Rae, things like that. You'll still see, you know, parts of that peek through because I still I still do very much love and respect the craft. However, it became this shift for me when I started to create a community. You know, by the time I started No Madness, it really 
started off as a, a web series where I was videotaping myself and I had these like little vignettes of what it was like when I was living in Japan and, you know, all the different experiences that I had there, every single thing in Japan was different to the United States. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter how big or how small the adventure was. It was something completely different and something that a lot of people in my network had never seen before. And I mean, to be honest with you, still now on the level of mass media, you still don't see it to, you know, the capacity that it actually happens. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was really just creating a place that I felt like I could relate to. I had lived in Asia after Japan. I ended up getting cast on a travel web series and moved to Chiang Mai, Thailand with three strangers. And then we had our lives videotaped. It was like a travel real world. Mm -hmm. And with that, you know, happening, you know, I ended up backpacking for a visa run into Cambodia. And on my way back, I caught dengue fever. Mm. So I was like in and out of the hospital in Thailand for about two weeks. And I ended up making the decision to leave the filming a month earlier so I could get back to the States, kind of get healthy, figure out life, get myself, you know, kind of situated. Mm -hmm. And it was when I got back that I was going through things I had never gone through before. You know, I had been gone the better part of a year and a half. So all of a sudden I was dealing with reverse culture shock, Yeah, you know, like coming home and home was, was like a foreign place. You know, it was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. And coming back, like being in these two countries that for the most part are pretty Zen and letting some of that New York hardness go and then coming right back to the Bronx and like the aggressiveness and how in your face, like that shit was jarring, you know? And so I was like dealing with that. I was having anxiety behind that. I was healing from dengue fever. You know, I was going through all of these things, travel withdrawal, as much as I was sick and kind of dealing with stuff, I wanted to go back out on the road and I didn't understand what this sense of urgency with that was. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was going through a lot of emotions that nobody in my family, including the guy back then that I was dating could relate to because they just didn't travel like this. Yeah. yeah. So. For me, it was like, yo, I need to find a community before my like head blows up. Mm -hmm. So I didn't find it. And that's when I realized that I was going to, you know, create it. And so I started with 100 people with the one prerequisite, which is still today. The same thing that you have to have is at least one passport stamp to get into the group. Mm -hmm. And it really just took off through word of mouth. I didn't realize that in answering my own call, I was answering the call of, you know, tens of thousands of people around the world. Yeah. Totally. I really love the stories that we share here on the podcast about not seeing anything out there that we could relate to. And that was the impetus for creating our own. I had Kamika Smith on here a couple weeks ago, and she was talking about the same thing with founding the Boss Network. And I just think it's amazing how your need to have that community resonated with so many people and has grown and grown and grown. So so it started with a hundred people. And for those of you who don't know now, like tell us how big Nomadness is now compared to those hundred people. Right now we're 16,000 worldwide. 16,000 worldwide. That is incredible. So much can happen in just a few short years. Yes. And I say that for the women listening who are hesitant to start something. And I know you guys are listening and you're thinking, oh, well, you know, Vita's this big, you know, whatever. But she started with, you know, just a hundred people that you knew, presumably, you know, all the people that you knew and, and them sharing with their friends. And you had to put it, you know, if you wait the years, the growth will happen, but you have to start somewhere. So you started and how did you start? So I, I know No Madness as a Facebook group, but I, and that you guys take trips and there's so much more. So I'm coming to it with, you know, probably some of the same questions that our listeners might have, like what was No Madness then and what is it now? So was it the Facebook group? And then now there's trips and parties and, and things like that. Yeah. And we've always grown on the Facebook group. I think I said this when I was on your panel, I had heard it somewhere else and kind of adopted it that if the internet was a geographical location, Facebook would be the capital. Mm -hmm. And so I've always, I'm like, you know, where else would you want to start building a community, but where everybody is, yeah. you know, so Facebook always made sense for me and their group platform has really evolved over time. You know, but even just a couple of years ago, I mean, hell, actually, even as soon as like last year, mm -hmm. you know, we were very much like, okay, as we build out the app for No Madness, like it's going to take over the Facebook group fully. And I'm going to be honest with you, I can't really say that I know that that's how it's going to go down anymore. You know, I think the app will have a place and it's going to generate people. It's going to allow an in for people who've been trying to get into No Madness. 
but I think there is a space for the Facebook group that may just always be there. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's where we started. It's where we've grown. You know, I'm very grateful to Mark Zuckerberg, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, for what he's created because it's allowed communities like mine to really flourish and eventually become businesses because I didn't know I was starting a business. Like I didn't go out to create a business. I went out to create a group of people that I felt like I could actually talk to Mm -hmm. about things that I couldn't talk to, you know, at home. And so from there, it was really their idea to start doing trips that I was very much against it. Because like I said, I was a backpacker. I was somebody who traveled on her own, you know, and now all of a sudden there's these people that are just like, yo, this is a travel group. Like, why aren't we traveling? And I'm like, yo, I'm not a tour guide. I'm not a travel agent. I have no interest in this shit. You know, like, I don't even know if I like you people, (laughs) you know? So for me, it was a big question mark, but it was one of those moments where I said, I said, yes. And it was like, yo, we started in September, 2011. We were on our first trip in January, 2012. And then like a couple months later, that first trip landed in the pages of Ebony magazine. And it was just like over from there, you Mm -hmm. know? So it was a lot of it. And it's funny because now five, almost six years later, like we don't even do group trips anymore. Like I've done almost 30 trips with them in five years. And I made the announcement last year that our Bocas del Toro Panama trip that we did in December was going to be our last trip and that we're actually pivoting to international pop-up events instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that was really scary, but absolutely timely and amazing. It's one of the best decisions I've made with the brand to date, Mm -hmm. but it's all about evolution. You know, I'm all about innovation and not staying in the same place. And, you know, when you have people that start popping up and groups that look eerily like yours and (laughs) start like poaching your people and shit like that, it's like, it's time to do things different. And it's Mm -hmm. like, no madness was the first in the jungle with the machete. Like I always want to be the one that, you know, moves first into a new space and is doing something innovative. And so right now, you know, I made that announcement last year saying in 2017, we were pivoting to events. Now we're in March of 2017 and we've already done four events. And, you know, the first two were in Johannesburg, South Africa in February. And we just wrapped up last week, two that we did in Jaipur, India for Holy Festival of Colors. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're already in the middle of our transition and there's more transitions to come. Like right now, it's a new program that Ted, uh, the company that, you know, the entity, amazing entity that does all the TED Talks and things like that. TED headquarters is in New York and they just started in 2016 doing this thing called the TED residency Mm -hmm. where they pick between 20 to 25 people, amazing brains from around the world, like some of the most innovative minds you could think of. And you are given like free office space. And essentially it's an incubator that they do at TED headquarters for four months. And you work out of the office, you're like brainstorming, you're building with one another, giving over assets, asking for what you need. And then at the end of the residency, you give a TED talk. And so right now, like I'm a part of the TED residency and it just started, yeah, it just started (laughs) in the beginning of March. So I'm just like a couple of weeks into this joint, but it's like the project that I'm working on for TED is bananas. And it's the next, next step of like, not just no madness, but this entire urban travel shit. And people will see that like, for me, it's always been about like, I'm not just an entrepreneur. I Mm -hmm. see myself as a culture creator. There's a culture that has been created behind no madness and what is now urban and black travel. And the next step of that and bridging this out and, you know, going into places, getting into property ownership, getting into building things that you know, that countries need around the world with our, you know, financial prowess. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's some next shit that we're on. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm building with Ted is going to completely change the game. And then being able to give a Ted, like giving a Ted talk has been on my like bucket list item life. You must accomplish this. Like it's going to terrify you, but you have to do it vision board Mm -hmm. for years. And knowing that I'm giving one like in a couple of months is just like bananas. You know what I'm saying? So it's a very, a very demanding, but a very amazing time. Mm -hmm. I I love that you shared about all the possibilities that come from, you know, running a group like this. I've been in the Facebook group, I don't know, a few years. I'm like one of the, one of the post, uh, poster child lurkers (laughs) in in the group. But what struck me about that group especially how large it is, is how much connectivity there is within, 
you know, people who've never met each other, we share this love of travel, but also there are so many similarities of people who have big goals. Like there are uh, so many go-getters and, and high achievers in the group as well. Would you say that with the people that are in the group, like everyone that comes in, there's a community that forms within the members, not just around travel, but around just life goals in general. Like, do you, do you think that it's also a community of of people who want to move forward in their lives? Yeah, it's a community. I mean, we have a ton of entrepreneurs, a ton of location independence. I mean, every couple months you'll see a post about somebody who was inspired by the tribe to quit their job. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and not saying that this stuff is easy. You know, these are these are life altering extremely difficult decisions that these people are making, but they're doing it, Mm -hmm. you know, and I give them more credit for at least trying and seeing what happens. And the people that complain about their jobs all damn day, do nothing to change it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's a ton of aspiration. I mean, the tribe is a community that really is a family, you know, like we have relationships that have stemmed from this. We have friendships, we have friendships that have turned into enemies. We have tribe babies, you know, people are literally like, meeting one another, Mm -hmm. connecting with one another Mm -hmm. on whatever level, and their lives are being shaped around, you know, this interaction that they're having with people that was, that started from nomadness, you know, and it's happening all around the planet. So that is absolutely amazing. I think that's very key to also the sustainability of the community. We're not one of these travel groups that is so rigid in content that people throw out. Yes, it has to be travel related, but a lot of times we talk about life, you know, Mm -hmm. like we talk about love you know, and motherhood, what it's like being a single parent. So you get all these real life dynamics and scenarios that are embedded in travel, you know, relevant to us because of what we do and what we value. But this is real life shit, you know, and and people need a place to be able to to vent about that because life is ever changing. Right. And, you know, we talk about politics, which is crazy now under the Trump administration, like you want to talk about people that are feeling it, travelers, travelers come yeah, on, you know? totally. like, dude's yeah. wilding. Mm-hmm. So we have to have a safe space for us to be able to relate regardless of where we're located. Right. I know that a lot of people are looking at your group and, you know, a lot of large groups and they wonder, okay, so all I have to do is start a Facebook group and then I can quit my job. <laughs> and that is really not how it works. So I, I wanted to know if you can give us a little more insight into how do you monetize this passion of yours? So many of our happy black women, they want to do what they love and they may have an interest in a whole bunch of stuff, beauty, teaching other people how to how to be better parents all these different things that they're interested in. And so, you know, what is the actual way that you can monetize it and not have to, you know, work a job that you don't like? The trips, the events, is there a membership fee? Is there, do you do speaking engagements? Like what is it, how do you monetize this? Right, for me, there's a ton of, there's levels to this. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is too, and this is like a disclaimer that should come with any advice that I give for people who want to be an entrepreneur. Like I am a massive risk taker. Mm-hmm. Like I take risks that most people probably wouldn't Yeah, and it served me well, but it's also terrifying when it happens. It's not that I'm moving this way without fear. Yeah. It's that I just have to keep going. And so, you know, I was dead broke in the beginning. I mean, I really started to see what this was while I was on unemployment. Mm-hmm. You know, like I you started this thing working in the freelance world in between that, you know, the project that we were working on finished and it was like, okay, I've never used this before you know, as a way to kind of sustain myself in between jobs, but like, let me give it the space to do this. And I was on pennies. It was like Mm -hmm. 200 and something dollars, like a week from unemployment in New York city. Like trying to live off of that in New York city is baffling, Yeah, you know? And so it was dead broke. And I didn't know what this was. Again, I didn't go into this creating a business. So I wasn't even looking to monetize this in the beginning. I just wanted a place where I could talk to folks that I related to and I could vent. It was really the things that they were asking for that made me realize I had started a business. It was kind of like an accidental entrepreneur Mm -hmm. in that regard. So like the trips was definitely one thing. Merchandising came almost hand in hand with that because it started off with t-shirts. People wanted t-shirts for the trips. That's grown online to like different products that we have. So merchandising is something that I knew nothing about and kind of like jumped right into. Obviously the events in the early days, to be completely honest with you, some of the bigger ideas that we had 
from our first international meetup, which ended ends up being our anniversary party now, to we did a cross-country RV tour mm-hmm. for three and a half weeks back in 2013, stopping at different HBCUs, and I would give presentations there. Mm-hmm. That All of these things were done through Kickstarter campaigns, in which in the first couple of years, I had to crowdfund the like not only their money but also their trust to know that I wasn't going anywhere mm-hmm. and that the brand wasn't going anywhere. There was a sense of sustainability. You have to prove yourself, especially in our community. Like you have to prove yourself before people start handing over cash to somebody that they don't know. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you started with Kickstarter. Yeah, we started I started doing Kickstarter. I had three like overly successful campaigns. One of the courses that I that I have that I teamed up with another person in the tribe, Ariel Loren, we have a crowdfunding mastermind group and, and, and a course where literally like she comes from like the digital marketing and, and people who don't have communities where I came from, like, I have a community, I'm a brand and an influencer. And we talk very in depth. It's like a three hour webinar on like all the tips and things that we've learned through the years of doing campaigns. Like we've crowdfunded about $50,000 between three different campaigns in the early years of nomadness. So I was using all of my resources, like Mm -hmm. all of them. And so crowdfunding was, um, Kickstarter specifically was my go-to. I like the all or nothing. Again, the pressure, it's not just pressure on me, but it's also pressure on the community to deliver or else it's not going to happen. It's just that simple. Yeah. So that was really part of how I did the earlier days, but then obviously like getting into the events, things like the conference, you know, now speaking engagements again, like partnerships and advertising, you know, we're in partnerships with Airbnb, different companies, Cantu came on, both their Africa and their domestic departments came on for different partnerships for events that we have going on this year. So it just, it changes. And the ad dollars and all of those things are a part of it. With us building out the app, you know, there's going to be parts of the app that are paid, you know? So for me, again, the focus wasn't about money in the beginning. And I'm actually glad that that wasn't the focal point because I think it would have taken away from the community because the community just would have turned into a portal to sell shit. And that's not organic. And that's not how I operate again, like building the trust, but also building the brand and building the community so that you have enough people where when you do drop something new courses are now a part of the fold for us as well. Like you have a community that you're actually selling to, you know, It, it doesn't become this like, you know, super laborious thing. Obviously you still have to market and advertise, but you kind of have like your, your core people that ride with you and set already. Yeah. I love that you shared that, you know, that you build the community before you even thought about putting any products in there. You know, a lot of people do it the other way around. And I always say, you know, people say, I want to, I want to start a course. I want to do a retreat. I want to do this. And I'm like, well, where are your people? You know, do you have an audience? Do you have a group that knows, likes, and trusts you for that? And so then they have to go back and build it. And there's just so much pressure that way. It's pressure. You're wasting money Mm -hmm. because you're wasting time at that point. You know, like I'm one of these people, I throw myself to the fire constantly. But my thing is, it's just like, listen, either it's going to work or it's not like go in, try it, pull out if you need to, you know, fast, but you've got to try it. The thing is, you can't really get a realistic view on if it's successful or not if you don't have the people in place. Yeah. So yeah, like I've seen people and no shade. I mean, every business is different. There are definitely some that have been successful without doing it this way. I just would never do it. To me, it's too much of a risk, particularly financially, to be like throwing, you know, darts at air, you know, because there's no wall to catch it. Right, right. I can't function like that. Well, I know that people look at you and they look at Happy Black Woman and they see the communities that we built and it can seem like, well, it would take so long to get there, but at the same time, you're going to have to do it anyways, you know, so to be successful, so you might as well start now. And this conversation just really brings up the importance of spending the time and building community because it can seem like, well... I'm just playing around on Facebook. I'm just talking to people. This is not really business building, but it really is because you're laying the foundation for making money later because these are the people that are going to be your first clients and customers. Right. And you need them to find out what they need. Right. That's the other thing. Like if you're not creating, if you're creating, you may think that you're creating a product that's extremely useful to them. If they don't tell you that it's useful, it's not useful, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know? And so, and that's something that you need to be like, you need to talk, they're, they're your focus group. They're not just your community. Yeah. It's like, before we started NMDN black box, it was like, listen, if we, I literally put it in the group. I was like, if we come out with a travel course, what are some of the things that you think would help you 
or also help your friends and family members that say that they want to travel, but they feel like they don't have the means or, you know, just that conversation that we get all the time. And really they set up whether they're like, they're not even cognizant of it, but they set up the blueprint of what you need to create because they're telling you what they need. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you don't have that community there, you're shooting in the dark, homie. Like (laughs) you may think you have an idea and not saying that you're wrong, but damn, wouldn't it feel that much more better to find out that, you know, you know, for sure that at least somebody in your community could make use of what you're creating yeah. before you put all your energy into it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I, I'm always curious about how other nomadic entrepreneurs manage their businesses. What is it for you that helps you stay focused and productive on all these projects as you are obviously, you know, supporting the community, creating the programs and products and services, and also doing what you need to do for yourself. Are there any practices or strategies or tools, routines that you use as you're on the road doing this as well? Yeah, I don't know. I actually think I have like an undiagnosed like ADD that just really, I've always been like really energetic, even as a child, Mm -hmm. really creative and always like juggling kind of a couple things at a time, which is interesting because now because of the, the depth and the gravity of so many of these projects that I have taking on for me, it's more so a necessity to be able to zone in Mm -hmm. and allow myself the ability to be able to concentrate on one thing at a time. Yeah. Because if I look at everything in totality all the time, which I used to have a tendency to do, not only is it overwhelming, but that's when you start getting into these situations of like, yo, I'm just not going to do shit. Like right. it's so much <laughs> like you know, saying, I'm going to go take a nap. And I have days like that. And to be honest with you, I honor those days where I'm just tired. Mm-hmm. Like I'm wiped out. I'm going to go take a nap. I'm very unforgiving with my self care because growing up, like in college saying yes to everybody, not having a sense of balance. Like I used to have severe anxiety and panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So learning that no is a complete sentence and I don't have to feel guilty about it. And I don't have to explain myself was life changing for Mm -hmm. me, you know, getting out of this people pleasing 24 seven to make sure that I'm okay became absolutely integral to this, you know? And so for me, it's about pinpointing people on my team, people that I need on my team, you know, to be able to really delegate some of this stuff and delegate to people that I trust will get the job done the way that I need it done. So I don't have to, so it doesn't end up being me doing the work anyway. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's hard sometimes because you evolve in the beginning. It's like you bring friends on because you don't really know what the fuck this is. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you know, as things grow, it's like, you have to start altering, you know, because if not, you're going to be in the same place or you're going to start moving at a rate that the people that you have there can't keep up with. Yeah. And so it, it's really like I'm in that space with a lot of things now and just kind of like really looking at what it's been versus where it needs to go right. um, because we're moving fast. And, you know, for me, it's like, you know, I, I would love to sit here and be like, yeah, I meditate at my altar all the time. And the truth is I don't all the time. I want, to, mm-hmm. but when I need to, I absolutely do. And I absolutely stop and take a breath of fresh air and kind of like walk away yeah. when I need to get my mind together. You know, I'm a big scheduler. I don't like, I already hate the fact that I'm so entrenched in my phone as is yeah. that I, sometimes I'll purposely leave my phone at home. Yeah. Like if I know I'm going to be out for a set couple of hours and I'm telling you, it's like the first phase of that feeling is almost anxiety. Right. It's like, what the fuck? Like why, you know? And then the other phase is just like this complete sense of presence, you know, like I'm a writer. I have the last like 20, you know, I have like 28 journals. I have my life since 10th grade on paper. So I will like leave my phone somewhere and just, I take my journals everywhere Mm -hmm. and I'm constantly writing. You know, I have a therapist because I think that there is something to talking to somebody and getting actual help Mm -hmm. when you need to work through stuff, you know, not just a spiritual healer, but an actual therapist, you know, so that's big for me. And reading and writing, just doing certain things that are very solitary and, you know, intimate for me and and my growth 
these are the things that mean a lot when I need to, one of my favorite things to do is I go to the movies a lot by myself, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm, I'm drawn to things that will completely take over my entire mental capacity and get me away from a computer or a phone Yeah, because I'm so entrenched in both. And I constantly need to, as a creative, I need to be present. I need Mm -hmm. to be in real life to derive inspiration for the things that I bring into my life personally and also professionally. Yeah. I love how you, you have such an awareness about what you do need, because I think for most black women entrepreneurs, it's a process because we're going from, most of us are going from really attending to what our employer needs. And then when it comes to building our own business, it takes a little while for most of us to figure out that you get to choose how this goes. You get to decide, you get to build your day around however you want. And I don't hear enough black women entrepreneurs talking about the personal part. Like, how do you take care of yourself? Like in a way that to many people sounds very selfish. What do you mean you leave your phone at home? What do you mean that you take these naps for yourself? What What do you mean? You know, you're supposed to be going to company. You're supposed to be doing this. There's people in the group that need you and all of this. There's always a pull. And what I've learned is that there's always more to do if you allow that more to take over. There's always more people. There's always more emails. And if you attend to all of them, you'll never take care of yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about team, just really quickly, who do you have on your team? Like, like are there certain positions? Are there certain roles? Like what would be the most important people that you have supporting you now? Yeah. So we have, I mean, the group that we have, that's really been there since day one, we affectionately call high council. What I'm in the middle of doing right now is kind of splintering off high council and creating like a separate business team that's really going to be getting into like the growth and the nuts and bolts. You know, high council is cool because there's this historical value to the tribe that these people have, you know, Mm -hmm. like they're familiar. They've been there from the beginning, from like the first couple months. And really it was like people that I pinpointed that had different assets, but were already showing a rapport in the community, even in its early days. Yeah. So these people... For people who don't know, you know, in high council, like, like this is a group of people that they help moderate the Facebook group. They help plan the events and things like that. Right, right. And so now what's happening is things are starting to splinter off. So it's like we have an events lead right now who's like killing it. Vanessa's absolutely amazing. She came on as a volunteer actually at our first conference and literally she just like struck everybody as completely having her shit together Mm -hmm. and and wanting to bring her on. I was like, listen, I'm very big on like, what do you want to do? What interests you? What moves you? So I'm not trying to fit you a square peg in a round hole Mm -hmm. in some type of, you know, some placement that you really have no love for, Mm -hmm. you know, and it shines and people work differently and you can see how hard they go in when they really care about what they're doing. And so Vanessa has been amazing. Um, a huge game changer for us, somebody that's on high council and also is going to be integral on the business end is Brittany. Mm -hmm. Like Brittany came in and completely changed the game with our entire social media. Like, I mean, just came in and blew like the socks off of it. And she's having a more entrenched, just a more involved capacity that she's going to be working with no madness. And, and I'm really looking forward to her. She's like my right hand in a lot of ways right now and just killing it, you know, mm-hmm. like killing it, killing it with social media. And then it's like, we're trying to get other people in. Like we want to build up the merchandising. You know, we have Vaughn Dabney, who's amazing from empty box media, who's our app developer. Mm-hmm. So we've been working really hard with him over the last, like, gosh, at least like the last like 18 months to get things in order with everything with the app. He's an amazing developer and graphic designer, you know, and then you have people who are on high council have been with me, you know, for years, the Jasons and Macarios, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's about growth and it's about next level, you know? And so just kind of figuring out what that blueprint looks like going forward is kind of like the mind space that I'm in right now as a CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, we've shared so much today and I know we could share more, but before we complete, I'd like to know, you know, from your perspective, seeing where you are now, looking back to where you started, there's so many women that are at that getting started place. Uh What's one piece of advice that you would give that woman who is like, well, should I start? There's so many people doing what I want to do already, you know, is this really going to work? Is it really possible for me to leave my job and do what I love full time? Knowing what you know now, what would you tell that woman? Well, there's, I would tell, those are a couple different scenarios and I'd give different advice to 
to them <laughs> because the wanting to start something versus like quitting your job and all that stuff, those are very different places for someone to be in. And it takes time, you know, but my advice for everybody all the time is just start. We get hung up on analysis paralysis, this idea of perfection, which is absolute bullshit. Like perfection, I, I've completely, honestly, I've completely given up on the idea of perfection. It just doesn't exist to me. Like as, as a business owner, as a creative, I just don't think perfection exists. And I think that whoever came up with this theology of perfect was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I do, I'm kind of like, who created this word and this idea like to hell with you because, because they're putting so much pressure on folks. You know what I'm saying? Like people don't know how to decipher. They just internalize mm -hmm. and, and digest and eat this whole idea up. And it, it, you start building from a, a place of fear, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like you, there's, if you start thinking about perfect from the beginning, like it's going to make you, you're going to become paralyzed. You're not going to want to start at all yeah. because why? Because there's no such thing as perfect. If no madness started off with what my idea of perfect quote unquote was five years ago, we're completely like, I had no idea that I would be sitting here five years ago. I had no idea that we would have been doing trips. I had no idea that five years in, I'd be like, you know what? I'm done with trips. Now we're going to do pop up events. Like perfection is a progressive, active entity. Mm. You know, it's constantly changing. And so you have to give yourself permission to not be perfect in order to just start. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Start somewhere and perfect along the way. Don't look at it as a noun. Look at it as a verb. You know what I'm saying? Like you've got to keep moving and rolling with the idea of perfection. You know, it's so resolute and that shit is terrifying you know, yeah. for anyone. Yeah. And so I don't know. I think I'm done with perfection. Like for real. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you put it that way because there are so many women looking at, well, I need to have a perfect. And the truth is there is no perfect and no one ever starts there. So thank you for such amazing wisdom for our listeners. Amita, I know everyone will want to stay in touch with you and where No Madness is going. So what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, if you want to check out, and obviously so many people are like, how do I join? Go to nomadnesstv.com. Click on the link that says Newbie Boot Camp. And pretty much that is your entryway into the community that is Nomadness Travel Tribe. And yeah, the website houses a lot of stuff. Our updated events are on there. So you can see what we have going on both internationally and domestically. So if you're interested, our course, NMDN Black Box, there is a link to that there. But you can also go to nmdnblackbox.com. And that is our six-month travel course where we've literally funneled years and years of information. We have a ton of experts that are in there breaking down everything from fear of flying to news hysteria to eating healthy while you're abroad to travel 911 speaking to our own Dr. Dafina Good who's a traveling MD you know about all the tips and tricks and just the know-how of people who travel all the time to give it to people who feel like they can't do it and or can't afford it we break down all of the barriers, psychological, financial, physical, to get you out there on the next plane. So that's really, really integral to what we're doing. And yeah, keep a lookout for the app coming for Nomadness, as well as my terrifying TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, but amazing, amazing accomplishment, something both professionally and personally I'm yes. really excited for and looking yes. forward to. So yeah, it's 2017 is shaping up to be to be dope. Yes. What an amazing year for you, Evita, and for all of the people in the Nomadness community. So I hope that you all will go and join and be a part of people that not just travel, but really have a forward thinking mindset. Thank you so much for being here on the show, Evita. It was a pleasure being with you in New York and now on the phone to spread your story to even more happy Black women. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for your platform as well. Very necessary. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies. Well, that is a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Evita and I hope that you will go back and listen to our previous episodes because there's so much wisdom available to you all for free. And you can find out about all of our previous episodes by going to happyblackwoman.com. Until next time, have a beautiful day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Happy Black Woman podcast. 
If you want all the show's notes from today's episode, go to happyblackwomanpodcast.com. Plus, we'll send you a copy of Rosetta's free life mapping workbook. We look forward to empowering you next time. And until then, do something this week that makes you happy.